All right. Well, today's message is the many woes of King Saul. The Bible gives us a glimpse into the uh, into the various uh, into various people's uh, lives, exampling both good and bad characters, good and poor decisions that we may choose the better for ourselves. Today we are going to look at the spiritual life of the first king of Israel, Saul, to recognize um, uh, and recognize his mistakes or woes, as I call them. But first allow me to set the background. Israel was originally governed by judges that were appointed by God's prophet. This is the way God designed the government of Israel to operate. But the people of Israel came to want different. They wanted to be like the rest of the world. The desire to be like everyone else usually means trouble ahead. God had called Israel to be unique in the worst, in this world. Leviticus 20 verse 26 And you shall be holy to me for I the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. Israel was and is a chosen nation by God. They were called to be different, to be separated from the world, not like the rest of the world. They were separated by God for the reason and the purpose of bringing the salvation of Christ to all other peoples of the world. That was their destiny. It was God's desire for His chosen people, Israel, to example a nation worthy to birth a Savior. Like Israel, we Christians are also called out from the non-Christian world. We see this in 2 Corinthians 6.17. Therefore come out from among them and be separated and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. May we separate ourselves from the uh, contaminants of the world and dare to live for God. The day came when Israel no longer wanted judges. They wanted an earthly king to rule over them like other nations. Over and over again they made their prayer requests for a king. In time, God gave them their request saying that there would be much grief upon Israel because of their desire to be like other nations of the world. And indeed, there has been trouble from that time forward. God always, or I should say, God's ways have always proven to be the best ways. God's ways have always proven to be the best ways. This is where today's message begins. We will look at the many woes of this first king of Israel, Saul. Saul's first woe, he disregarded God's ordinances. As king, Saul would do whatever he wanted. For he lived in the day when the king's word weighed heavy in the land. As King Saul could uh, do whatever he wanted. For he lived in that day. <laughs> Uh, it was true that uh, he was king over the nation of Israel, but he was not king over God. He did not have authority over God. Let us begin by looking at 1 Samuel. That's where we're going to uh, start with. This 1 Samuel 13, chapter 13, verse 5. 1 Samuel 13, 5. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. 30,000, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people 
as the sand which is upon the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Mishmash, Mishmash uh, to the east of Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal. And all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel the prophet. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. The prophet was delayed. And the people were scattered from him. Scattered from Saul. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now wouldn't you know it? We read in verse 10. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. In these verses we see a failure of Israel's first king. Saul knew that it that it uh, knew he was to wait for the prophet to offer the sacrifice before God. Yet when the pressures of life, when the pressures of life came, he chose to ignore what he knew was right and performed the sacrifice anyways, disregarding God's ordinance. May people, many people today are much like Saul. They want God to help during a crisis, but they ignore Him the rest of the time. They want God's blessing, but they fail to meet the conditions for those blessings. They want to go to heaven when they die, yet they want to live like the unsaved world and make excuses for their sins. They want God's favor but fail to read the Bible, pray, and attend church regularly. Sadly, like Saul, the Lord will take from them their reward. Luke 8.18 18. Luke 8.18 18. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not... Uh, does not have, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. And Revelations 2 verse 5, chapter 2 verse 5 of Revelations. Remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else Jesus will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. Notice that repent is repeated twice in the Revelation verse. We are to be a repentant people. Striving to live our lives pleasing to God. While trusting in salvation through Jesus Christ. Now speaking of the oracles of God, we Christians are to honor and handle the Bible with respect as it houses God's oracles, laws, and instructions for Christian living. How you handle your Bible tells me in part your regard towards God's guidance within its pages. The Bible is not just any book. It's the inspired Word of God. It's a holy book. If I have a pile of books, I try to remember to set the Bible on top of the pile, not buried within the pile. It's important enough to make sure that it's on the top. If I am carrying it with other books, I carry it on the outside. Dear people, May we honor and respect God's written word, the Bible. Saul's second woe. He trusted in himself 
self-pride. So let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13, beginning with verse 11. Carrying on with verse 11. Chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, verse 11. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Mishmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication or sacrifice to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered the burnt offering. Here we get a little better picture or a better understanding of the situation. We see Saul's kingdom was threatened by a massive, no small army, it was a massive enemy army, the Philistines. Saul wanted very much God's blessings and protection over him and his kingdom, uh, over him and his kingdom against this massive military threat. He had asked Samuel the prophet to come and offer a sacrifice to God and to seek guidance. Samuel had agreed to come in seven days, but when he was late, Saul grew impatient. Impatience can at times be dangerous. That is why we must practice patience. (laughs) That is why patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. While Saul continued waiting, uh, many of of Israel's soldiers became, became frightened at the huge size of the enemy army, and so they deserted Saul. They went AWOL. Impatient... Saul then decides to take it upon himself, since he was the king after all, he took it upon himself to offer the sacrifice to God without Samuel the prophet. Here's the problem. According to God's oracle, only the priest and prophets were to offer this sacrifice. Although Saul desperately wanted God's blessing and protection, which is a good thing, he disobeyed God's ordinance in the process. Saul wanted God's help, but failed to honor and respect God in the process of seeking his help. Even though Saul knew that Samuel the prophet was to offer the sacrifice, he being so absorbed with his position as king, believed that he had the right as king to supersede the prophet and thus God. The point being that Saul adjusted God's instructions to fit his own way of thinking as if he knew better than God. He he was obsessed with self and self-pride. In our day, some people read the Bible or hear the gospel and then readjust the message to their in their own minds to fit their selfish lifestyle and excusing their sinful living. Some of these people in self-pride even boast of their Bible reading and Bible knowledge, yet they never truly apply its words to their life. How many times do people think that they can halfway obey God or tweak the Bible to fit their lifestyle or go to church Sundays and live like the rest of the non-Christian world during the week thinking that God will understand. These people are living a lie a self-imposed lie. Like Saul, many, pe- uh, many believe that they can do wrong and supersede the written Word of God considering themselves as, as having everything under their control. They believe they are okay and that, and that they are not that bad of a person. 
that they are actually a good person. After all, they never killed anyone or robbed anyone. I've actually heard these types of statements out of the mouth of someone. These people are self-righteous, deceivers of themselves, believing that they can manipulate or somehow convince God to accept them into heaven just as they are, unwashed, unholy, and rebellious. I've got sad news for these people. Only those who are blood-bought and washed by the Holy Word and those who keep their spiritual garments clean will be able to enter into the presence of a holy and righteous God. Remember, it was self-pride that caused Lucifer's fall from heaven. We must be honest with ourselves, people, and see the true state of our soul as God sees us. And then allow ourselves to grow in the purity of Christ and the Word. The Bible says what it says for for our good. God created mankind and He knows the best way for us to live our lives happy. Statistic after statistic reports that those who seriously live the Christian life has a tendency to live longer lives than the average person, have less issues and problems and struggles than the average person, experience experience happier, more fulfilling lives than the average person. If we want that better than average life, then we are not to make the Bible pleasing to us, but rather we are to adjust our life to the guidance and parameters of Scripture. Continuing on. The results of the king's disregard for God and his selfish pride was the removal of the kingdom from family succession. You know how it is that, that uh, they usually, uh, you know, the, the sons, the, the heirs of the king get to be the next king and the heirs, uh, the children after that get to be one of them, get to be the next king and so on. So as a result of the king's disregard for God and his self-pride was the removal of the kingdom from family succession session as we read beginning with verse 13. And Saul said, uh, Samuel said to Saul, Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God which he commanded you for No, the Lord would have, he would have, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not, shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And of course we know that man will be David. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Then Saul arose and went up from uh, Gilgal to uh, Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people present with him, about 600 men. Look at this verse. After Saul finally, after Samuel finally came, God spoke through the prophet to inform Saul that he was going to remove the kingdom succession from his family because of his selfish appointed action. Self appointed action. Saul seems unconcerned about the loss of the kingdom to his son. At least he was still king. 
So it was business as usual for him. And again, he snubs his nose at another of God's ordinances when he counted the number of people to find out how many fighting men were available. You see, God wants his people to trust in him, not in the number of fighting men they have, and not in their military strength. Do you remember the time of Jehoshaphat when God sent not the military men, but the praisers and the worshipers in the front lines of the battle, and they won the battle without even fighting? And if you want to look that up, it's in Second Chronicles chapter 20. You can read the story. God wants us to trust in Him. Saul's third woe. The third woe of Saul. He was disobedient and rebellious. This next woe we are looking at has its roots way back in time nearly 400, four, more than 400 years or about 400 years before Saul was even born. This is where the roots are. Way back to the days when Moses was leading the Israelites on their long journey from Egypt to the land of Canaan. As they traveled, the Amalekites would repeatedly attack the Hebrews from behind, picking the stragglers off little by little. This was a continual annoyance and people were being killed. Because of this repeated harassment, God told Moses that one day he would deal with the Amalekites after Israel had settled in Canaan. This is found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 17. Verse 17. Remember what Amalek, the king of the Amalekites, did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. How he met you on the way and attacked your rear ranks. All the, str all the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord your God is, ha, has given you rest from your enemies all around the, in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance that you will blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget. Now let's jump forward to another time during the reign of King Saul's King Saul and we'll pick this up in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel 1 Samuel chapter 15 right there at the beginning verse 1 verse 1 of Samuel chapter 15 Samuel the prophet also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over, over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him, how he ambushed Moses and the Israelites on the way when they came up out of Egypt. In short, it was time for the promise to be fulfilled that God had given to Moses nearly 400 years earlier. God always keeps His promise, always keeps His word, even after 400 years. And know this, people. God will keep His word about Jesus returning even though nearly 2,000 years has passed since His birth. Hallelujah! Yeah! Verse 3. Now go and attack Amalek 
and utterly destroy all that they have. And do not spare them, but kill both men and women, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. God gave instructions to Saul to attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all people, men, women, children, infants, and their animals. Now some may wonder why should the children, infants, and animals be killed? I don't have time this morning to give examples, but just to say that the people were so corrupt that it even affected their livestock. Thus, nothing the Amalekites touched was worth saving in their land. It was all detestable to God, affected by their sin, corrupt through and through, like much of our world is becoming now. Do you hear that? Much like our world is becoming now. Sin abounding. Affecting almost everything they were involved in. Yeah. The Amalekites as a people... This is the other thing. The Amalekites as a people had nearly 400 years to come to God from the time they had tormented Moses. But they continually neglected to do so. And now their judgment day had come. Dear people, there is always a judgment day. The Bible declares that there is a judgment day yet coming upon the whole earth, but many are neglecting and ignoring that approaching time. But that day will come as God keeps His Word. Although the churches proclaim the warning week after week, still for many, that day will come upon them unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Continuing on, verse 4. So, Saul gathered the people together and numbered them and tell, tell, tell him 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. Here he is repeating his same pattern of disregard for God's ordinances. As God did not want the soldiers numbered so that people would put their trust in Him and not look to the strength or weakness of their military, even as we see example in one of Gideon's battles as found in the book of Judges. Judges 7.2. Let's look at this verse. Uh, uh, Judges 7.2. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who who are with you are too many, lest Israel claim glory for themselves against me or over me. Lest Israel claims glory for themselves over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. God led Gideon to shrink the military from 33,000 to 300 men. And guess what? They won the battle. Hallelujah. God wants us trusting Him in our life. No matter what battle we are going through, God wants us trusting Him. No matter what that battle is, no matter what that doctor may say, no matter what it is, believe and trust in the Lord. Back to Samuel in verse 5. And uh, back to Saul in verse 5. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, 
Go, depart, get out from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Verse 7, And Saul attacked the Amalekites from uh, Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Verse 9, But trouble, but Saul and the people spared King Agag and the, be- and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Saul had failed to carry out the complete instructions of God. He killed all the Amalekites except for their king. And he spared the best of the animals. In this, Saul had sinned greatly. Saul's actions were not only disobedient, but rebellious to the authority of God. Apparently he had another one of his brilliant ideas. Saul's problem was he thought. He did what he thought instead of obeying what God thought. If we would learn to simply obey God and stop trying to quote work with God or help God, our life would be much better. Saul selfishly thought he could get away with obeying only part of what God had said. Perhaps he thought it would look good for the people to trophy the defeated king before his subjects. Saul thought he knew better than God. He thought he could handle things better than God. That's how Satan thought before he was kicked out of heaven. He thought he could handle things better than God could handle things. How many times do people today think they know better than God? How many uh, people today think they can handle things better than God? Verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. He cried out to the Lord. Verse 12, So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. This account shows that Saul was so stuck on himself that he built a monument in his own honor after victory in battle. Like the pharaohs of Egypt, he didn't give glory to God, but to himself. How many people today in self-pride are busy building their own empires while ignoring the God who loves them? For Saul, the battle was won and he looks good. So away he goes. He doesn't care about the prophet anymore. So he travels another way, avoiding the prophet. He doesn't need him anymore. Just as some people today want the church when they want it. 
but could care less about it the rest of the time. This is not right. The way we live our life tells others what we think about God. I'm going to say that again. The way we live our life tells others what we think about God. When we are seen going to church, it tells others something about us. That church and God are valuable to us. When we are caught reading the Bible, it tells others that it's important to us. When we bow our head at mealtime, it tells others that we recognize God as our source of supply, not man. When we clean up our language, it testifies that we honor God from our lips. Rough, crude, and gutter language should not, should not be on the lips of anyone who is truly a Christian. The Christian is not to say, Oh my God, without thought and intent of purpose. For God is holy, and to so speak is careless use of His identity. Understand that, people. It's such a common phrase today. By so speaking, God becomes just a thoughtless, vain byword. It should disturb you, even anger you, that people would so dishonor the God who loves you and them so much. It is Satan's ploy, understand that it is Satan's ploy to get people to regard God carelessly and thoughtlessly and to abuse His title. A sobering verse is found regarding this in Matthew 12, 36. But I say to you, that for every idle word man may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Dear friends, let it be your goal to live your life not in self-pride, not wrapped up around yourself, but in honor and love towards God and His Word. May we learn to yield our whole body and mind in humble subjection unto God in His kingdom. And let the light of Jesus shine through us that others may come to the saving knowledge of salvation because of our example. Continuing now with the rest of the story. This week we find that Samuel found Saul. So Samuel found out where Saul was and he went to him. Uh, and remember Saul had taken that alternate route to avoid the meeting with the prophet. So here we go. The fourth woe of Saul. He was a liar and a deceiver. He was a liar and a deceiver. 1 Samuel chapter 15 is where we are at. 1 Samuel chapter 15 beginning with verse 13 is where we're jumping into the story. Verse 13 of 1 Samuel 15. Verse 13. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the command of the Lord. Yeah, right. Not. Nah. When, Saul, uh, when Samuel arrived, King Saul's pride led to self-deception. And he lied directly to God's prophet, saying that he had completed the command of the Lord. But that was not true. And Samuel is about to call him on it. Perhaps Saul wanted to look good in the prophet's eyes, figuring what harm would a little... Uh, is a little lie for the sake of his own reputation. After all, he did most of what the Lord had commanded. He just tweaked the command of God to make it work better for him, and then he lied about it. Imagine lying to God's representative, a prophet. 
lying to God's representative, a prophet. How is it that people think they can get away with lying and telling half-truths and even sometimes to lie to a man of God or try to deceive the church? How self-deceiving can they be? They're deceiving themselves too. Yet today people will look a man of God in the eye and lie straight up and say whatever they think the pastor wants to hear and then never fulfill their verbal statements. If only they knew the peril they had brought upon themselves by their own doing. I heard that someone had gone to one of the churches I know asking for gas money. An associate went out to the person's automobile to find out, uh, uh, to find out that they did not need gas at all. Asked why they lied held them accountable. Well, so why did you why did you lie about it? See, asked why they lied. The person replied saying that they figured out they wouldn't get the money. They figured they wouldn't get the money otherwise unless they lied about it. Well, they still did not get the money. <laughs> In the days of the early church, people would sometimes drop dead for lying. It appears that people no longer revere God's representatives. Perhaps it's time for pastors, evangelists, prophets to once again call to account such people, even as Samuel is about to do to Saul. People's respect or disrespect their regard or disregard for the fivefold ministry, and we're talking about apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, their, their regard or disregard for this fivefold ministry, their respect or their disrespect uh, for the fivefold ministry, reveals their heart regarding God Himself. Continuing with verse 14, but Samuel said, Samuel the prophet said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ear, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people uh, spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the, re and the rest we have utterly destroyed." Notice that Saul does the same as Eve did in the Garden of Eden, passing the blame on to someone else, her husband. Well, Saul says, the people brought them. Yet we already read in 1 Samuel 15, 9, verse 9, back there a little ways, it says, but Samuel and the people... He just left out himself, you see. But Samuel and the people spared Agag the, and the best of the sheep. So he left himself out of that and he just blamed the people. Believe me, if the king wanted the animals killed, they would have been. Samuel did not destroy all the animals as the Lord had commanded, but decided rather to permit some of them. Saul, thank you. Saul did not uh, dis uh, destroy all the animals as the Lord had commanded, but decided rather to permit some of them to be brought back to sacrifice to the Lord. How abhorrent. Perhaps he thought... No, we're only guessing as to where his thoughts might have come to his reasoning. So perhaps he thought, there he goes again thinking in other words, his thoughts instead of God's thoughts. Okay, perhaps he thought how terrible it would be killing all those animals and not benefiting something from them. If he were to separate, if he were to spare the best ones to offer as sacrifices upon the altar to God, they would still be killed and God would have all those sacrifices offered to him. So you can kind of see how that might be a convincing idea, though wrong. Because it's not obeying God, it's twisting it. 
twisting God's command. He said, God said totally destroy, and he's sparing. He says, what? And he might have been thinking, well, they'll still be killed, just we will be able to offer them as sacrifices, and in that process, they will be killed. Twisting God's command, you see. Or perhaps he was considering the savings it would bring to the Israeli budget because of the many animal sacrifices performed in those days. In any case, the idea, think about it, the idea of offering an offering animal sacrifices to God that were from the enemy was bad enough. But worse was the thought of offering to God a sacrifice that he would count as corrupt. Think of offering animals in disobedient in disobedience. Animals that would have already uh, that should have already been destroyed. These animal sacrifices would not be acceptable to God because they were offered from the sin of disobedience and rebellion, even stubbornness. So as Saul blabbered on, making excuses, we read verse 16. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, and I'll tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And then you can kind of see his response there. And Saul said to him, "Uh, Speak on. Samuel spoke boldly to the king. There are times for us Christians to also speak boldly, but be wise in doing so. Verse 17, so Samuel said, when you were, he's speaking to the King Saul now, Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, or when you didn't see yourself as a big shot, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the, uh, the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Verse 18, Now, now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and uh, fight against them until they are consumed. Why then... Did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you uh, swoop down on the spoil and, and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And, Samuel, and Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed. Stubbornness, you say, is in there too. Okay? But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission. Yeah? Uh, which the Lord has sent me, and brought back Agag, king of of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Not true, as King Agag was an Amalekite. (laughs) So he didn't utterly destroy them. All but him. Verse 21. But the people took the, but the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which would have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice the Lord your God in Gilgal. And I put emphasis on different words because I want them to stick out in your mind. First he says, the people took the plunder. And then he says, uh, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. See how cunning Saul speaks. You can tell whose voice he's really listening to. It isn't God's voice, I'll tell you that. But uh, uh, by saying sacrifice to the Lord your God, it's like saying, would you deny a sacrifice to your God? It was an attempt to make Samuel feel bad about uh, blaming him Uh, and and not allowing the animals to be used for sacrifice. You see the little game he's trying to play there? Verse 22, So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in or compared to obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, listen to this and take notice. To obey is better than sacrifice. 
and to heed than the fat of rams. People, obedience is high priority to God. Understand that. Obedience is high priority to God. If He tells you to do something, asks you to do something, then it's important to Him. And He... uh, And he's looking to see if you're going to do it or not. The prophet goes on to say in verse 23, For rebellion is like as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and adultery. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord... God also has rejected you from being king. Samuel announced to Saul that because of these sins, he would be removed as the king of Israel. So what did Saul say when he heard the shocking news that he was going to be removed as king of Israel? Verse 24, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice, still blaming others, saying, It's their fault I sinned, instead of taking the responsibility upon himself for his wrongdoing, you see. I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Verse 25. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. He verbally repented, but he did not repent from his heart. You can see that. This uh, was was not true repentance as he was saying come back and worship with me so that I will look good in the people's eyes that's what he was saying uh, uh, God hears the words of of people but he looks upon their heart so it's not just what you say God looks deeper to the intent of people God hears our words, but He looks upon our heart. He looks upon your heart this morning. And so what does He find? Verse 26, But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Saul turned around to go, oh boy, uh, Saul, as Samuel turned around to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore it. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also, the strength of Israel talking about God, will not lie nor relent. For he is not a man that he should relent. Now what's he saying by that last uh, verse? Here we read that Samuel boldly, in, in, in these, these verses, we read that Sam, Samuel boldly told Saul, God will take the throne from you as he is not a liar like you. Neither will God repent like you need to do. See, that's how he's really speaking to him. By saying what he just said there. Verse 30. Then Saul said, here he is. His words again. Saul said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. Please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Notice he does not say the Lord our God or the Lord my God. So Samuel turned back after Saul and Saul worshipped the Lord. Again, Saul's lip service repentance was worthless, saying only what he thought the prophet wanted to hear. Do you you get that? 
Some people do that. They only say what they think the minister, the prophet, the evangelist wants to hear. Uh, or the judge, if they're before a judge sometimes, you know. They'll take that risk and try to just be deceiving, lying. <clears throat> so Saul's lip service, repentance was worthless, saying only what he thought the prophet wanted to hear. This was proven when he right, right away continued on and he asked Samuel to come and appear with him before the people for appearance sake. Verse 32. Then Samuel said, Samuel said, Bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past? But Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces, in pieces, before the Lord in Gilgal. Wow. Now was the end of the Amalekites, wiped from the face of the earth. All known Amalekites. Then verse 34. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at uh, Gib Gibeah in Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And uh, we have one more woe that we're going to look at. He was on repentant. Saul was on repentant. We saw, we saw this truth already, but we will switch to another short account to stress the fact. The background to this next reading was Saul's relentless pursuit of David to kill him in an attempt to keep him from acquiring the throne that the prophet Samuel said would be take, uh, uh, the prophet Samuel said would be taking, taken from Saul and given to another, which was of course David. Verse three of chapter twenty-four is where we're going to be. Chapter twenty-four now, First Samuel twenty-four, verse three. Saul came to the sheepfold by the road where there was a cave and Saul went in to attend to his needs. In other words, he had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the, the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do with him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Verse 5. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward, went out of the cave and looked and called out to Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. Now notice David's humility and respect for the position of the king. Now what are we to learn from this? Similarly today, uh, a similar, uh, we today may not always like our president or our governor or, or our judge or whoever, 
but we are to respect the position and honor honor the person of that position okay we even if we might not like their policies and what they do or we might not like them as a person or whatever uh, we should respect the position even as David did and honor the person of that position and we have a wonderful opportunity in this country to help vote them out next time if need be and so that's that's wonderful we have that privilege you don't vote out a king. He's he's continuous until, uh, he, you know, he uh, until the he dies usually, or depending on the policies of the of that country. But we have the right to, with our leaders, to vote them out. Uh, most all of them. So uh, anyway, respect the position, honor the person of that position, and vote. Get out and vote. Verse 9, reading in verse 9, And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men and say, Indeed, David seeks to har- uh, seeks your harm. Look this day, your... Uh, look, this day... I, I started over here. Look, this day your eyes have seen the Lord deliver you today into, the ha- into my hands in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you. But my eye spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against the Lord, for He is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yes, see the corner of your robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet you hunt my life to take it. Let the Lord judge between you and me. Let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? Therefore let the Lord be judge and judge between you and me and see and plead my case and deliver me out of your hand. So it was, in verse 16, so it was, when David had finished speaking these words to Saul, that Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice, and he wept. Then he said to David, You are more righteous than I, For you have rewarded me with good, whereas I have rewarded you with evil. Wow! Truth spoken by Saul. Verse 18. And you have shown this day how you have dealt with, with me. For when the Lord delivered me into your hands, you did not kill me. For if a man finds an enemy, will... He let him get away safely. Therefore, may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. Wow! David was being blessed by his enemy. Now here, we take this home for ourselves today. We Christians shouldn't be surprised when we are blessed by our enemies. Don't let it shock you. Say, wow! <laughs> It happens. It happens sometimes. You'll find out that an enemy blesses you. Alright, so Saul continues now uh, speaking in verse 20. And now I know indeed that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Wow, more truth. He can speak truth sometimes. We see from this reading that Saul had murder in his eyes. He was chasing David to kill him in order to protect his throne uh, and, and that of his heirs from an imagined impending death threat from David. 
David and Saul both knew that David would someday be king. Yet, here in these verses, David was clearly communicating to Saul that there was no threat to him nor to his sons from David personally. By calling Saul father, he called Saul father in these verses. You can look back and find it. All right. By calling Saul father, he was reminding him that he was his son-in-law. That he was family and not a threat. By displaying the cut piece of Saul's robe, showing that to Saul, David was stressing the point that he intended no deadly harm to Saul's throne. I mean to Saul personally. No deadly harm to Saul personally. And by calling Saul the Lord's anointed... If you look at the verses back there, he called, uh, he called Saul the Lord's anointed. By doing so, David was trying to show that he himself respected the Lord's anointed, anointing and, and, and the position of the king. And, it if, and if the Lord put Saul on the throne, it would be the Lord who would remove him or he would wait until the natural death of Saul. But as for David himself, he would not force the issue or, or, nor rush providence along. In other words, David wasn't going to help God put him on the throne. How many people try to help God? God doesn't need help, only our obedience. That's our lesson from this portion of scriptures. God doesn't need our help, only our obedience. In fact, God would be able to get a whole lot more accomplished if people would simply learn to cooperate with Him. We can all take a lesson in patience from David. You know, he was chased for years. He knew he was supposed to be king. And he kept fleeing and running. He ran here, he went there. <sighs> Living out in the wilderness at times. In uh, enemy cities, you'll find out. He went to enemy cities and lived there for a while. And just fleeing from the king. Patiently waiting. Though he was being hounded. And uh, anyway, I haven't gotten to, to that part yet. Uh, so, right here. Sadly, sometime after this event, where it seemed like maybe Saul was remorseful and that. But sometime after this event, Scripture show, shows that Saul had failed again to truly repent. That's what it amounts to. And he took up the chase after David uh, once again to kill him. And like I said, David had to hide in all sorts of places. He had a tough time, but David was patient, waiting upon uh, the fulfillment of God's word because God said it would happen and God keeps His word. And I'm going to repeat what, what I said last week about the idea. You know, it's been around 2,000 years since Jesus was born. And he said, uh, he declared that he will be returning. Uh, the angels declared that he would be returning in the same fashion on the clouds or through the clouds that Jesus would return. And the scriptures declare that. And so one day, God keeps his word and Jesus will come back. It don't matter if it's 400 years like the Amen Malachites before they were received their punishment or 2,000 or 3,000 or however many years before Jesus returns. But He will. He is on His way at some point in our future. Hallelujah. In the future. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we need to take a lesson in patience from David. Alright. Saul... So here Saul, he, he did not truly repent, but cha continued to chase, chase uh, uh, David to try to kill him. Now, now think about this. Saul had the chance to repent of his murderous intent to abort God's plan. He was trying to abort God's plan. He's fighting God. Come on. Uh, reality check here. You aren't going to win. So he had the choice to repent. 
uh, of this mur uh, murderous intent to abort God's plan in making David king, but Saul chose not to repent. And listen what he did instead. Instead of repentance, Saul added stress to his life that was unnecessary. He didn't need to have that extra stress. Okay? Uh, instead of repentance, Saul's, uh, Saul's uh, choice caused him to live his life in unnecessary uh, fear. Is David behind me? Always looking behind him. Afraid that David might be uh, going to attack him or some of his men, you see. So he lived a life in unnecessary fear. Saul wasted kingdom money. Just think, the Israeli budget was depleting because he had his military and he himself, he was neglecting his kingdom duties in part because he was out chasing David here, there, and all over and still in the palace. So that was another thing. But he wasted kingdom money, kingdom supplies, and military uh, personnel for years in pursuit of David. How sad. When he could have just repented and know that, know that uh, someday David would be king. See. But no. In closing, as you can see, sin has its side effects. Fear, stress, waste were all attached to Saul's unrepentant heart. If you have sin in your life today, repent and get rid of it. Don't allow it to preoccupy and waste your time, your resources, and your life. It is our job, our responsibility as people uh, to keep our life clean before our God. Take responsibility. We are to direct our mind and body into subjection, obedience, and honor towards God. Jesus is just a prayer away. If you have a need this morning, why not use this wonderful avenue of prayer and have a talk with Jesus? Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for watching today. And I trust that the message ministered into your life. Now, I want to give an opportunity to those of you who may have never committed their life to Christ. You have the opportunity to do so right now. To become a Christian. And how do you do that? Well, this instruction manual called the Bible tells us exactly what to do. In Romans 10, uh, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that, uh, uh, in other words, believe with your being that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation and here it is whoever verse 13 whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved hallelujah if that's you today then I ask that you'll go ahead and you'll bow your head right with, along with me. And when, and when I say a phrase, you repeat it where I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you believe what you are saying, if you mean it from your heart, from your being, then you will become a Christian. You will be on your way towards heaven. Hallelujah. So let's, let's pray. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. First of all, Lord, I ask that you'll forgive me for all my wrongdoings. Forgive me for all my sins. And Lord, I ask that you will come into my life. For I want to be a Christian. Lord, I commit myself to you. I commit myself to living a Christian life. And I thank you 
for such a great salvation. Thank you for what Jesus did for me on the cross. That he died for me. And he rose again, victorious. That I can live a Christian life. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Thank you. Now, if you prayed that prayer today, then you're a Christian. Now, there's three important things that as believers that we need to do. And number one is to talk with God every day. It's called prayer. Just talk with Him about anything and everything that you're uh, concerned about or, or have questions about. Your happy moments, your sad moments, just share with Him. And, uh, and when you do pray to Him, when you do talk to Him, uh, give a little bit of time, a little bit of moment in your prayer time uh, to listen. Because He may have something to say to you that day. Uh, and from time to time, he, he may. And so listen for his response. Don't just give him your list of things that you would love to have him do and, and, and that. But also thank him. Thank him for what he has done in your life. So spend some time thanking him as well. Uh, number two, I would say, is read the Bible. Read it often. It's our uh, success manual. Successful uh, for succeeding in our walk, our Christian walk. Our, our Christian success manual. And uh, so read it often. And when you get ready to read it, go ahead and, and say a little prayer to God asking Him to help you to understand it. It's not so much how much we read. It's more important that we understand even if it's the little that we read. Uh, that's what's important about reading the Word. Because He helps lead us and guide us and train us and teach us. He helps us to know, understand who He is, how He operates, how heaven operates, as we read the book. And uh, lastly, attend church. Find a Christian church and attend there. And uh, eventually become involved in that church and help that church to grow. Help, uh, uh, because that's what the church is, does for you. It helps you to mature in your Christian walk. You get support there from other believers that, will, that can encourage you in your faith. And you get to hear the message being explained to help you understand what, the, what Christianity is about, what the Bible's about, and how God operates. And so, attending church is very important to a Christian's health, uh, spiritual health. And uh, so, do those things and enjoy, enjoy the journey of your Christian walk. Welcome to the kingdom.